Hi there, this is Baron Stevens, and uh, today I want to do the second part of my discussion about flexibility on uh, saxophone and clarinet. Uh, last time we talked about mouthpiece uh, pitch and flexibility, and uh, working on developing some more elasticity in here so that we can bend the pitch around some. But there's a, and that's a pretty good and powerful exercise by itself, but uh, one of the drawbacks I've found to it is that it, you know, we can cheat a little bit and move our jaw up and down. Um, and uh, you know, this exercise I'm going to talk about today, which I call the palm flexibility or the palm key flexibility, is uh, one that uh, you can't really cheat and use your jaw, and I'll demonstrate that here in a minute. Uh, but uh, first of all, what we do with this is, you know, like with the mouthpiece, when we were kind of doing that siren exercise, we kind of do the same thing, um, except now with the saxophone all together. So we don't have to deal with just the mouthpiece and all that. And sometimes just playing the mouthpiece by itself is a little bit tricky. But it's a little bit easier, I think, also to get the sound to produce when we do it on a whole sax. Um, but I'm going to start with a palm D, and palm D would also work for soprano sax. Um, I'll talk about tenor and uh, clarinet here in a minute. But uh, um, I start off on the palm D, and then uh, and another advantage to this exercise is then I can I can play the next pitch that I need to aim for. So after I play the palm D, I'll also play the high C sharp. So then it gets the pitch in my ear. So I go. So now I want to aim for that C sharp pitch. But so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the palm D, and now I'm, without changing the fingering, I'm going to bend in here down to the C sharp. And then I kind of do that siren exercise where I'm going between the D and the C sharp. Now if I try to do my jaw, we get that sound. So that's why we want to avoid using the jaw and do everything from in here. Now there's, you're going to be tempted to move the jaw. It's not the end of the world if you do, but when you get that honking sound, that is because the jaw dropped while you're doing the exercise. So after you get the C sharp going, then you aim for the C. Then once that's going pretty good, and I, I should say this takes a while to develop. Um, most of my students, when they're first doing this, even if they've done spent some time doing the mouthpiece flexibility, they usually don't get to the C sharp right away, and then they have to spend a week or two or three or whatever just getting it down to the C sharp, and then, <laughs> then we aim for the C, and that can take several weeks, and so on and so forth. So this can take months, years, you know, in, in order to get to the, the the distance that eventually we hope to be able to get to. Um, I, maybe while I'm thinking about it, I should say that uh, one of the things that uh, um, I found from doing this is it doesn't really matter how far you go. Some of the benefits that we get from this, you don't have to be able to bend that high D down to your kneecaps. Um, you just need to be able to do the exercise some because I think just the, the procedure of warming up these muscles in here has an effect on tone, which is the main reason why I believe we do this. And I'll talk about that more later. But uh, going back to this, you know, once you get the C, the D to C, then D to, to B, And the D to be flat. And I'm doing it kind of quickly here, but if I were really working on this, I would probably spend a lot more time going back and forth between, um, especially the ones where I'm starting to reach my limit. Um, now I'll do D to A. D to uh, A flat. And D to G. And then yeah, that's about where my limit is, so that's where I would need to spend a little bit more time uh, warming up into it. So that would be how you do it on the alto sax. Now on the tenor, do it a little bit different. You can do palm D as well on the tenor. But what I've found is, especially for your younger students who are just developing this flexibility aspect, it's hard to get very far very fast and it can be a little bit frustrating. So if you know the high or the palm F, so that's the all six of these plus this here, so it's you know order-wise, one, two, three, four. Um, so there's our palm F. Now some saxes have, with your third finger, you hit this uh, high F sharp key. And you can do it from the high F sharp as well if, if you have it, but I'm only gonna do it from the, pi, the, from the palm F. And so, yeah, so it's kind of the same idea though. F and then play the E to get it in my ear. And 
etc. And that's kind of working as low as you can and then just doing the siren thing for a while where you reach your, start to reach your limit. Um, for the berry sacks, eh, got bad news. Um, you can sort of do it and try it even from the palm F, but you don't get very far on the berry. It's uh, uh, because just it's so big, you just can't get a lot of uh, distance on that. Um, so usually you just have to stick with the mouthpiece flexibility exercise, or if you have a smaller sax, an alto or a tenor, you could do it on that. It has the same effect. You don't have to necessarily do it on the berry for it to, to have the benefit. Or if you have a clarinet, you can do it on clarinet as well. Now, of course, clarinets don't have palm keys, so I can't really call it the palm key exercise. But I just call it the high C flexibility exercise on this. So I just go to the palm, or the, not the palm, the high C here um, with the, the open at the top here. And then it's kind of the same thing, work my way down from C to B. B flat. A. A flat. G. So it's kind of fun on clarinet because in, in the higher instruments, it's because you can go a lot further um, with it. Um, and, you know, I guess while I'm on clarinet, uh, clarinet players don't get into this as, as much as maybe sax players do, but it still has the same tone benefits that I'll talk about here. Um, but uh, this enables us to do some of the you know, effects like... That's mostly the throat flexibility that enables me to do that. A little bit with fingers, but mostly it's in here. So this uh, flexibility exercise um, can be useful for that. So um, I guess the last thing I wanna cover here is why do we wanna do this? And I think there's several good reasons. Um, to me, again, the most important, number one is what it does for us is, is it improves our tone. Uh, a lot of times I have my students do what I call a before and after exercise, and of course, it's, um, not going to work for me now. I've got I recorded one earlier, and hopefully you can hear the difference of the before and after. But where I have them play a long tone, and then after that, do the flexibility exercise, then play the long tone again. And uh, especially if like if you play against a wall, where you can hear the reflection back, you should hear a better tone quality. Even if you only bent a quarter tone or less, um, just doing that flexibility. Um, just seems to limber up these muscles, which I, I believe makes us resonate better with the instrument, which gives us a better tone. Um, so even if you have no interest in, in what we're leading up to with these exercises, that alone I think makes it worthwhile to do it and why I teach my younger students to do these things even. Um, another thing, of course, a greater t control of pitch. You know, so without moving my jaw, I can, you know, have a little bit more pitch control where I can put things. So as I'm hearing, if I hear I'm slightly out of tune, I don't have to sit there and do any adjustments or anything like that or drop my jaw. Um, I can make the adjustments in here. So that's probably the next, in my mind, the most next most important thing. Another important thing is it helps us be able to switch between instruments. I mean, one of the reasons why I can go between alto and tenor and clarinet and barry and soprano um, and bass clarinet as well is because I have the flexibility here that I can place my oral cavity where it's supposed to be specifically for that instrument. Um, you might have heard times, uh, like uh, you might have heard a clarinet player playing a saxophone and it just for some reason didn't quite sound right or vice versa. Um, or even sometimes an alto player playing tenor, you know, someone that plays that instrument a lot and, but they just don't quite seem to sound right on the other instrument. And that's because they haven't figured out and developed the uh, flexibility to get their oral cavity, to, oral cavity to where it needs to be for that instrument. Um, so that's another great important thing. Um, but and then uh, the next video I'm going to do in this series is on overtones. Um, and uh, so this flexibility that we're doing is something that helps improve our ability to do these overtones down the road. So quickly, um, just to demonstrate. Yeah, so basically the bugle songs use the overtone series, but we can do that as well on um, the woodwind instruments. And uh, you know, just kind of, it's just kind of refining this uh, flexibility exercise to the next level. So anyway, so next time we'll talk about the overtones, and uh, thanks for watching. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me or uh, leave a comment here at the, at the bottom of the page. Thank you.